I know it's making me shake. <sighs> Who lets a 42 year old man stay in a home with 14, 15, and 16 year old girls? Talking to him and things. Yeah, we all wanted that. I can remember us all running up to the big, because it was a big old stately home building thing, running up to the door and opening the door as he's pulled up. Do you know what I mean? And we're all. at a concert or something. How he targeted the girls who didn't have parents at the home. Exactly. It only just penny dropped the other night. All the ones that had their parents around them. When I lived there, I, the jobs I used to do for a three to nine year old were just unbelievable making fires emptying chamber pots do you know what I mean I was a slave um and I used to get beaten a lot so I went to my doctor and I pulled my sleeves up and I put my arms on his desk and I just said help me What do they say about opening a can of worms? Mm. I didn't say that. I said I was opening a can of snakes. Hope you're enjoying our podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, uh, Up. And before this one even came in, Jen was already gagging to try this product, weren't you, Jen? I was literally going to purchase it before they sent it, and they sent us five wonderful flavours. So today I'm going to sample the apple flavour. And how it works is through the sense of smell. So instead of having a drink that's flavoured with all that rubbish in it, you are getting activated through the olfactory receptors in your nose, and you are thinking if this flavour's in the drink, but it's not, but it's takes your senses to a whole new dimension. And it's wild because you're not drinking disgusting fizzy drinks. So this is perfect for the gym. And for Christmas, the new chocolate orange flavour is out. And if you go to the website, you can check out the Christmas bundles. This is at Erop's website, link in the description box. Oh, okay, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, I'm watering at the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I will show you how to use this simple pod. Is you just pop it over the nozzle here, and you lift it up till it naturally stops. Oh yes, try oh, some of that. I like that you were desperate. Try some of that. <laughs> mm. The flavour is intense as well, isn't it? Why yeah. do you think this would make the perfect Christmas gift, Jen? Because you always overindulge over Christmas and you know what it's like in the January period. You all want to lose weight. Turkey burners at the gym. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, this bottle is absolutely awesome. I'm, it's my new gym bottle, so thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Link is in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. Right, back to the podcast. All right. It's a great honour and privilege today to be here with Sheila Sheila was in the news. Some of you may have seen the stories. And I'm sure a lot of you who've watched the Savile coverage have heard of Duncroft School. So back on, it was the 16th of October 2013, Sheila received a letter from Surrey Police. It was part of Operation U-Tree. And that just opened this box then of things, you know, stuff that happened back when she was at the school, when Savile visited. And we are going to get to that. But firstly, huge thank you to Sheila for coming on and, and sharing your story and being brave. And, you know, like you said earlier to me, you, you hope this does inspire other people who've been yeah. through these things because mm -hmm. it is raw and traumatic for many of them. They keep it closed in. So that's one of the reasons we do these interviews. And also, we're going to go back first before we get to the events at Duncroft and just find out about you and your life story. And so where were you born? Um, I was born in St. Nicholas's Hospital in Plumstead, which was a house. 
I might add. <laughs> um, I've spoken at Plumstead College a few times, <laughs> doing drugs education talks. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, lived in Greenwich with my mum and dad. And it's really strange how I've got some really vivid memories of like where we lived and everything. And I've had all this clarified since that, you know, my brain's remembering before I was three years old. What do you remember then? I remember where we lived. We lived above a baker's um, in Greenwich. And I remember watching the changing of the guard out the <laughs> windows. And I remember shouting from the fire escape down to the woman in the baker's, can I have a cake? <laughs> <laughs> and all sorts. And my dad coming home with hubba bubba chewing gum and I wasn't allowed to have it. Chewing gum. Yeah. I was only a baby, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> I couldn't eat that. <laughs> and being put in the cupboard and I could see it through the glass cupboard but couldn't have it. And yeah, lots. And Do you remember uh, how did your parents meet? I don't know. Don't know. Nope. And what about when you were entering the school system? Do you remember that? Uh, I didn't stay with my mum and dad. Okay. Um, I found out since I thought I was with my mum and dad until I was about three. Mm. And I had these other memories of being other places with children and things, but I never knew what they was again until I got my care records. I was with foster parents before my mum mum and dad gave me up when I was three. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, I understand how traumatic that is, Sheila. My mom was given up at birth by the Catholic Church, told her mom, because her mum had been jilted at the altar, that you will burn in hell if you have a per if you're a single parent. And the, the, the mum didn't want to give her up. Yeah. She was forced. Fortunately she went to a good family. Um, but it traumatised my mum when she found out when she was a teenager. She wrote a book about the search for her mum. Yeah, and it really affected her for the rest of her life. So mm. I imagine, you know, at such a young age, being given up, that's a lot to go through. <laughs> it got worse. It got worse. <laughs> do, do, do you know the reasons why your parents cited for, for giving you into care? I've been able to piece together a lot of things over the last... 10 years or so, and one of them was being seeing a clairvoyant um, and finding out stuff about my mum. And my mum ended up at the Maudsley as well, but she was having ECT treatment. Oh. Yeah, she wasn't very good at all. Oh, dear. Um, and I need you to prompt me because I forgot where I was going she there. You were talking about going into <laughs> foster care, was it? Um, I was in with foster parents before my mum and dad split up, but then I went to live with my dad's mum. To live with your dad's mum? Yeah, and I think I was about three and a half Yeah, from what I can make out. And how long did that last? Too long. Too long. Yeah. It was um, six years of hell. Um, never saw my mum and dad in that six, six years. No, tell a lie. My dad used to come and visit with his kids, but I used to be threatened not to call him dad. Oh, my goodness. I know there's going to be people watching this at night. Um, and I never saw my mum from the day she left, and I can still remember her with her scarf and her trench coat going round the corner at the bottom of my nan's road, Sorry, coming back, waving, I've still got that vision in my head and I never saw her again until I was nearly 10. Sheila, you said you went through six years of hell. Did you have any happy memories from that period of your life? Not until recently. Mm. All the memories I had from that time were bad, horrible, um... Yeah, it was, I've had a lot of things, again, I've had a lot of things clarified by other family members that I was a slave when I lived there. I, the jobs I used to do for a three to nine-year-old were just unbelievable, making fires, emptying chamber pots, do you know what I mean? I was a slave. Um, and I used to get beaten a lot. 
And who who was the perpetrator? It was the beatings. Yeah, we we keep gonna keep names out, but you could generalize. Okay. Grandmother, uncle, auntie. Oh my goodness. Um constantly it felt like as well, because my nan was always, yeah, she's been naughty again. So it had to be the belt or a hairbrush across my knuckles or just a whack round the head. Um, but the most confusing thing about that time, you know, sorry, I've got to add this one now, was the fact that the uncle that was doing that with the belt to me was also abusing me and being really nice to me every Friday night when his wife was at bingo. <sighs> um, and it was very confusing. Very confusing because my nan had also given me a, a talk on, I suppose it's a sex talk, you call it. She stood there in front of me in the bedroom saying, you don't let men touch you here. You don't let men touch you there. You don't touch men there. And then every weekend her son was doing that to me. It was like, well, well I don't know. I don't know how I got through that. I don't know. Um. But, yeah, I was the bad one again because I used to have outbursts. I used to have, I don't know, screaming abdabs, they used to be called, where I'd stamp my feet and pull my hair out and scream because everything had bottled up so much and I just had to let it out. And then I was the, the bad child that had to be moved on. So, Sheila, you went through so much horrific abuse at such a young age. Mm. Did that just become normal, that life become normal to you? It's like you're indoctrinated into this house of horrors. I didn't know anything else. I hadn't, people didn't talk to me either when I was a kid. I didn't get taught how to have emotions and um, how to feel about certain things. You know, I, I was I was either cleaning or doing what I was doing or I was up in my room. Um... Did you have any friends at that age? I knew the boy next door, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> we used to have a little hole in the fence that we used to talk through. It made me want to cry. So he was a respite from it. Yeah. Yeah, and going to school, obviously. But even school was horrible because... My nan didn't buy me new clothes, obviously. She always moaned about not having enough money for me, so everything came from jumble sales. I wet the bed every night up until I left my grandmother's. I only had a bath once a week, so nobody spoke to me at school. <laughs> um, I had one friend who had a skin disease, Kay, and we used to, because she couldn't stand up a lot, we used to sit in the playground and talk but that was it she did no no teachers or parents who were in a position to help you ever try and take you to one side and ask anything what's going on in your life no mm. no in those records my man's like yeah she's done this she's done that da, 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 da. i've tried no nobody ever asked me i don't there's some of it in there i'm telling them about my nan locking me in under the stairs while they go out and things and leaving me. <laughs> um, it's in the records, but nobody, nobody done anything about it. So your nan and that side of the family were questioned, but they were being believed. Is that what was happening? Mm, I don't know if they got questioned. Do I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I was only little, so. So you were just completely on your own, abandoned, and there was nobody to help you. My other uncle was the best to me. There was there was an uncle that was good to you, yeah. and he wasn't abusive in any way. No. So he was. And did you ever no. feel like you could talk to him, or were you too young to process all I, that? I was too young, yeah. but I can remember him like playing and tickling me and things. And he was the one that said that I was a little slave when I lived at my grandmother's. Um, 
and they were going to adopt me, but oh. they didn't have enough bedrooms because mm. they had children already. So maybe life would have been different. That no. <laughs> so did you say you were at grandmother's for six years? Yeah, I was. I think I was about nine and a half when I left there. I think from what I can make out in the records and things. What was the reason that you left there? Because I was bad. I was just, she couldn't cope with me no more. So what was your <laughs> destination? Um. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> I started going to stay with all these people that I didn't know. My mum's sister, my Auntie Mary and Uncle Stephen, I think it was. In Tidworth, um, my uncle Bert, which was my granddad's um, brother. Uh, where else? I stayed with my mum for a while in Cuxton in Kent. And did this get you away from the abusers? <laughs> yeah, the ones in Hampshire. I don't know. I feel I want to tell this little bit, but I went to stay with my mum in Cuxton after I left my nan's. I can remember staying at my dad's sometimes, but never actually staying at his, staying at somebody else's. My mum used to hit me. She, can I swear? Yeah. <laughs> she was putting out the washing one day and I, I was sitting on the step and um, she called me a fucking little Oh my goodness. But I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. I'd never heard of it. So I I turned around and went, I'm not a fucking little bitch. Mm. She come over and whack me right in the head and I was mm. like, wow. Cuz I've always put my mum on this pedestal even though all the things she's done for me, I've always put her on this pedestal and always wanted to be like her and and then she gave me up again. I went to boarding school after that. Which boarding school was that? Posh one. <laughs> posh one in Rygate in Surrey. Okay. No, not really, I'm joking. <laughs> Too posh for me. By that by that time of my life, I was, yeah. well, I, I, that's when I got diagnosed with my first mental health, mm. proper de mental health disorder when I went there. Um, yeah, what? the Royal Alexandra and Albert. What did they diagnose you with? Emotionally unstable, mm. which now is EUPD. Okay. So, did the boarding school get you away from the abusers? Yeah, while I was there for the year. Okay, for one year. But my behaviour got me chucked out. Right. <laughs> Not my behaviour, because it wasn't me. My tank, my like nightmares and ripping sheets up and mm. things and. Some of the stuff I was, the way I was behaving, I was drawing pictures of naked people. So the symptoms of your trauma got you kicked out. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, always blamed myself for that, but it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. The, that, that dark energy was put into you by those evil people. But I'd done a year there um, at the boarding school. I quite liked it. I was like, I thought it was okay. I thought mm. everything was okay. And <laughs> reading the records, it wasn't. <laughs> but I'd got away from all that abuse, so I was happy. Um, I stopped. I don't think I... I think I'd stopped wetting the bed all the time. Then it sort of fizzled out. Um, that did. But yeah, I know I went from there. And we're going on from that one. Yeah, yeah we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna go on. So you've got this respite now. You're feeling happy. Yeah, but you do, you do have these symptoms oh. that that get you kicked out. Go on. That was the other thing at the boarding school as well. Um, I got new clothes. Mm. I'd never had new clothes and new <laughs> shoes, <laughs> and it was amazing. Not just school uniform. Yeah, evening clothes as well. <laughs> it was like it was just the best it really was <laughs> so, so would you say you had a chance to start flourishing at that point start what to start just 
becoming more normal in your life. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. What was that word? Flourishing. Oh, flourishing. I thought yeah. you said foraging. No, no, foraging. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was lovely. I joined the choir, even though I can't sing. Um, you know, we, we used to all have our jobs to do and... I enjoyed it. And did you make friends easily though? I don't think I made. I made one friend who had a glass eye. Yeah. <laughs> Bless her, Carol, her name was. <laughs> Nobody would talk to her because she used to take her eye out <laughs> at night to wash it. <laughs> Because nobody else talked to me, I spoke to her. <laughs> Bless her. I always remember her, her brother had done it with a, a little army figure. I remember, I remember mm. that. It's weird what you remember, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so why did... What, what was your next... Uh, after the year at the boarding school, what was your next destination? Um, I then ended up at... I think it was called a reception centre in Sidcup. Okay. In London, um, it's where they put you, I found out in hindsight, till they see how you behave and then they sort of put you out to homes and things. Mm -hmm. so I obviously did quite well there because I got put into a nice home, like mm. the six of us. So is that all girls in a home? No. It's mixed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what was the atmosphere like there? <laughs> Me and the girl I shared my bedroom with, <laughs> we hated each other. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well, she hated me. I'm not blaming it all on her. I mean, I'm not a nasty person, but because of the way she was to me, I retaliated the same. And we used to fight. And then mm. when, we used to, when we used to go to school, she used to get her friends to, like, run past me and hit me and things. Mm. Um. But being in the home, I'd had more stability and, again, clothes, food, I don't know. Things that people take for granted. Yeah. You had a whole new appreciation of them. I got fed up with eating pig's trotters. <laughs> <laughs> They're not very nice, believe me. When you're a kid, give, having a pig's trotter put in front of you is oh. like... <clears throat> but, um, yeah, my nan couldn't afford to feed me properly, she used to say. Mm. Tripe and pig's trotters. <laughs> oh, tripe. Oh, my nan used to rave on about tripe. <laughs> <laughs> What's that stomach lining? Is oh, it or God. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Um, yeah, the reception centre was good. I can remember my auntie coming to see me at the reception centre, my mum's sister, because people sort of went and came back in my life. Mm. <laughs> it was like, you know, and she appeared at the reception centre and she, she bought me a guinea pig, actually. And from there, that was my auntie Elsa, from there, when I went to the children's home, I used to go and visit her all the time at the weekends because she didn't live that far away, and that was really nice. Was that your but, first pet, the guinea pig? Yeah, apart from my nan's. My nan had a dog. How did it feel to have your own first pet, the guinea pig? Something to care for. If my daughter could hear this, she'd probably like be... Oh, no, I can't believe you've just asked her that question. <laughs> <laughs> My guinea pig didn't last very long. Oh. One of the other kids put it on the swing no. and pushed it. No. I'm not laughing at the poor guinea pig. Oh, dear. I was devastated. Yeah. I, was de I can't believe you just asked me about the guinea pig. <laughs> Because your daughter's going to find this uh, <laughs> situation. But, yeah, and then I buried it, and then something dug it up. And so I was even more devastated. No. Um, so, yeah, my first pet didn't last oh. very long. But, hey, yeah. <laughs> so, so how long were you living with your cellmate you didn't get along with? Oh, goodness, I was in that home for four and a half years. Oh, wow. So how, what? how old were you from the beginning to the end of that then? I went to live in Abbey Wood from Stonecroft, I think it was called, the reception centre. Mm -hmm. I went to live in Abbey Wood when I was 10. Okay. Because I, I was still 10 because I ended up going to 
junior school for a little while mm -hmm. before senior school. Um, sorry, what was the question? So, so you were there from ten to fourteen. Yeah. Okay, and you did yeah. you did participate in school. Were there any particular subjects that interested you at school? I got really good school reports. Do you? I was shocked. I always thought I was a dunce. Oh. And then I get these school reports <laughs> and I've got A's and A pluses and B pluses. Wow. And I'm like, wow. What were your favourite subjects? Mm, I like like craft art and mm -hmm. craft and things, but I loved English. Yeah, me too. Because my English teacher, Mrs. Collins, was also lovely as oh. well. Um yeah, I used to write her a whole book of homework. No, I didn't. But, <laughs> but yeah, I was I was quite shocked when I saw them school reports. I was like, it's amazing what you can tell yourself yeah. if you say it to yourself so much or someone else is telling you you're no good and all that. But yeah, so that was nice. But then the children's home closed down. And the people who run the children's home, Mr. and Mrs. Pigeon, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't laugh, Walter Pigeon's, like, relation, I might add, as well, if anyone knows who that is. <laughs> um, and I was devastated because it was another rejection. Mm. And I didn't take it very well. They moved me to another home in Eltham, Oh, God, this is where it gets a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, the man that run the home in Eltham, he was an abuser. Oh, dear. Physically abused if mm. Mr. F um, and I've had this clarified from other people that were in the home that I've met in the recent years, do you know what I mean? And um, because I'd gone completely off the rails by then, wow, <laughs> a lot of things happened in a short space of time. I was not going to school. I was hanging around with um, some older lads because my friend knew the older lad's sister. Oh... Um, I ended up getting raped oh, by them gosh. and not telling a soul. Not a soul. And I know what I'm going to do here. I know I'm going to jump because I don't want to stay there. Yeah. But the next day, I pleaded with my friend from school, please let me have some alcohol from your mum and dad's drink cabinet. Please, please, please. I went on and on and on at her all through the dinner break. She let me fill up a Coke bottle. Do you remember the glass Coke bottles years ago? They're not, they weren't plastic, they were glass. Mm. I filled it up with all these different spirits, not realising how strong that was just going to be. Um, drunk most of it. Went on the bus to Woolwich. This was the day after the rape because I just like, Bew. I don't know, I didn't know what was going on. Just like killed myself, really. If they hadn't, have, my friends that were with me hadn't have called the ambulance when they did, I wouldn't have been here now. Oh my God. Um, they were throwing water over me in the toilet with the dustbin lid, like trying to revive me because I just like glug, 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 drunkness. I didn't care anymore. I'd had it, and I didn't tell nobody. And, you know, they took me to hospital after that. And Mr. F came to pick me up from the hospital. We got outside. No asking me why, what, how. Just another whack round the head and taken, taken back to the home. So what did I do that night? I packed my bags and off I was again, went again. And I just I just kept doing that until they was like, right, we've had enough of this. Um, and they put me in a remand home in Croydon where you can't get out. 
<laughs> Great big wire fences that like you can't get out and you have to wear these special uniforms. I didn't know what was going on by then. What was the day-to-day -day routine in there? Very rigid. Um, yeah, your jobs, whatever. Bed at 8 o'clock, I can remember. No smoking allowed or anything. Um, yeah, and it was another assessment place. And that's when I found out how much my IQ was up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's probably why I can remember a lot and like, everything as well. Mm. Um, yeah, it was an assessment place. And from there, I was sent to Duncroft. So how old were you when you arrived at Duncroft? I was 15 the month before. I arrived there on November the 24th, 1974. Wow. For people who are not familiar with Duncroft, how would you define it? Well, it was defined to me as an approved school, which basically means... There's blocks on the windows, so you can't get out the windows. The doors are locked at night. So it's sort of like a like a prison, I suppose. And what about when you went to sleep? Did you have your own room or was it like dormitories? I shared a room with two other girls at the time. And did you get along with them? Yeah, I had a couple of um, girls that I got along with more than the others. We were similar. That's what I was thinking, that, that perhaps they'd had similar backgrounds and for the first time you were able to relate. We never spoke about it. We never spoke, okay. No. Was it understood that you'd been through things? I think it's just that you, you can sense, can't you, from yeah. somebody. Mm -hmm. um, I've never spoke about anything until Operation New Tree come along. Yeah. I never told no, nobody, nothing. Mm -hmm. I might have snippets here and there, maybe if I was drunk, but that was it. <laughs> so would you say you were happy then at Duncroft in the beginning with these girls that you got along with? I was never happy. Never happy. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But on, on the scale of everything you've been through, would you say it was a relatively, in the beginning of Duncroft, would you say it was a relatively, it was an, an improvement perhaps, from previous? <laughs> Not from the home I was in for four and a half years, okay. no. Okay. That felt like a family, because mm. there was only six of us. It, and you uprooted from that. Yeah. Yeah. So anywhere I went after that, I, I just wanted out of it all. Yeah. I kept running away and... <laughs> at, at, at Doncroft what was the day to day activity well I went back to school mm -hmm. because I'd missed quite a lot of school and I started doing O levels as they were called then mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's funny the O levels I was doing was English and um, I can't remember what it's called sewing I can't remember what it's called there was English li literature, wasn't there? There was English language. Yeah, no, levels. no, no. I was doing another, I was doing two others as well. One was like, I was sewing, doing sewing, sewing. and doing cooking. Home economics. That's it. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> see, I, was, I did all levels That's too. the one. What did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't look old enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I started to do O levels there and it was really good because it was back to routine and mm. things, yeah. And how old are you at this point of the story? Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. How many years were you at Duncraft? No, I was only there from November hmm. 74 or 70, no, hold on, where are we? Um, I was only there from the November. Oops, sorry. The November until I think it was the May was the last time. Okay. And how did Savile make an appearance there? <laughs> Very flamboyantly. Was he? <laughs> oh, my God. 
Yeah, when we found out what was happening. Yep. Because you know how we got to be going there, don't you? I don't know. Could you explain to the viewers? <laughs> We've got a lot of viewers and some in America as well, and they're not that familiar right. with the story. Apparently, he was friends with one of the girls at Duncroft's mum and dad. Oh. I think her name was Susan. Don't quote me. I'm not sure. Okay. So when they've gone to Miss Jones, who run Duncroft, mm. and said about him coming to Duncroft, like, yeah, she trusted their judgment, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how he came in. And then the first time you heard of him, was it announced that he was coming in advance? Or Yeah. And what kind of, uh, was the, did it create a buzz because this guy's a celebrity, top of the pops, that kind of thing? Oh, God, I feel really bad for this. <laughs> um, yeah. We all wanted to be part of, you know, part of him being there, near him, like whatever, talking to him and things. Yeah, we all wanted that. I can remember us all running up to the big, because it was a big old stately home building thing, running up to the door and opening the door as he's pulled up. Do you know what I mean? And we're all... <sighs> I've been at a concert or something. Do you know what I mean? <sighs> <clears throat> but not all of them. Not all of them used to do that. Do you know, I was thinking the other night, Sean how he targeted the girls who didn't have parents at the home. Exactly. It only just penny dropped the other night. All the ones that had their parents around them, they didn't go to clunk click. They didn't get abused. <laughs> it was evil and very calculating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so that first day, then there's, there's a buzz that this celebrity's coming to Duncroft. And what was your first visual of him? <laughs> Jewelry. Jewelry. <laughs> Jewelry. Yeah. Shell suit. Like, mm -hmm. um, just, wow. <laughs> <Didn't> <laughs> Couldn't he, believe he, he was there. Didn't he used to show up in his white Rolls Royce and stuff? Oh, he had a few different colored Rolls Royces, but yeah. One of them was white. I think one of them was yellow, was it? Mm. I think, yeah. Mm. And then <laughs> what, what was his role? Like, did he did he give a speech? Did he do some kind of... No, he'd bring somebody with him a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, he'd bring cigarettes, records, like 45s. <laughs> um, I can't remember what else. Cigarettes, records, oh, and sweets and whatever. And we only used to get either 10, 20 or 30 cigarettes a week, all depending on which group you was in um, there. So to have that the was... currency. Oh, God. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, and, yeah, he knew that. <laughs> so how, how, what, how did he distribute those things that he brought in what 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 kind of like how did he say you're gonna get this you're gonna get that did everyone just get called to a room and here's this 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 i can't actually remember yeah i can remember it being on a table mm. i don't know if it was us or him or i don't think he did it i think he just uh, uh, we all got like what we wanted well <laughs> can you remember him addressing the girls at Duncroft giving us, you know, talking to them, saying stuff, anything like that. Am I allowed to say names? And if you could, got to cut them yeah, out, yeah, go for it. We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can remember one time in the big uh, lounge bit because it was huge because there was quite a lot of us there. I can't remember how many, but I know there was quite a lot of us. And he brought Freddie Starr with him, and um. They both sat in, one him, one was there in one chair and one was there in another chair, quite high back chairs, I can remember them. And us girls were all in front, all around, like sitting there listening and 
And they just used to, well, they swapped rings. They swapped rings. They both had a ring on their little finger and they swapped them over and said, that's it, we're friends now, do you know what I mean? Um, and, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's the sort of thing you just show off. <laughs> yeah, he was a show off, and all the noises and. Was that a regular thing that he brought other celebrities with him? Hmm? Was Gary Glitter one of those? No, he was at the Clunk Click show that some of the girls went to, but he didn't actually come to the home. Or if he did. Because sometimes I did go away at the weekends back to my grandmother's. I don't know why I went back to my grandmother's, but I did. <laughs> Just to get out of there, I suppose. Um, but no, I don't remember him coming to... Are there other celebrities that you do remember coming to Duncroft? Yeah, Sparks. Sparks. Yeah. The weirdy ones. I can remember them coming. Um... I can't remember who else. <laughs> Sorry. Rolf Harris? No. Who else would Savile have been with back then, James? <laughs> what celebrities was he? Pops, Top of the pop type people, yeah. There was some <gasps> Tony Blackburn. It's funny you should say this. I don't know if you're going to be able to leave this on there. Okay. My friend of 16 years, my male friend of 16 years, um, I've always said to him that there's something about Tony Blackburn. I don't know what it is and nothing had ever been done. And then I watched your podcast and I was like, I said to him yesterday when he come round, I said, see, I said, I told you and I can't figure out why. The only thing I can think of, because we used to go to the BBC as well, to the Clunk Click shows at the BBC, and I'm thinking maybe he was there in the changing rooms afterwards. I don't know, but I've always had this funny, not right feeling about him. All right, let's get to that, because, you know, I do talks in schools, and they give you a sheet of all of the guidelines, the things you must adhere to, if a, if a kid comes up to you and talks to you, you you know you can't be giving talking to kids, giving them personal details. There's got to be a teacher present. Mm. How does this go from Savile just waltzing into this, you know, into Duncroft, and now suddenly he's getting girls out of the school, taking them places? Well, I know that couldn't happen in this day and age, but was there just no like internal uh, rules that pro prohibited that kind no. of thing? No. The, the staff used to take us to the BBC. They'd just drop us off there. So the staff, the Duncroft there. staff would drop you off at the BBC? Yes. Okay. And then come back and get you later. Okay. And they weren't around in the evenings because we used to do tattoos and all sorts. We did. So they just weren't around. So what was the first time you were invited by Savile to go to something outside of the school? Um, I think it was about March time because I've actually got a letter from my social worker saying he'd seen me on the TV. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sitting on a beanbag. <laughs> what show was that? Clunk Click. Clunk Click. So what was yeah. Clunk Click, just to explain for people not familiar? It was about getting people to wear seatbelts, basically. Okay. Because that was before it was you had to wear a seatbelt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they used to show people that hadn't worn a seatbelt mm. and things to go to the shops and that. But that's what it sort of started as. And then it ended up we were going on the stage and met the Hollies and Lindsay DePaul and the Wombles. And <laughs> the Wombles. Yeah. They, st <laughs> they stank, by the way. Them, them furry suits in all them lights. Oh. <laughs> So did Gary Glitter, though, apparently, according to the girls from the previous week. He smelt a B.O. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> what was the first you ever heard that Savile was, you know, about his behaviour? Were there any rumours of his behaviour um, that, that was had circulated Duncroft about him being abusive? 
We used to brag to each other. We used to brag about who'd got him to do the most. Yeah, but yeah. you you were minors, and um, you know anything of that nature is one hundred percent his accountable for because there's a, there's a duty of custody, isn't there, over minors in which he took advantage of? You know, he used to stay the night. No, I didn't. Yeah. So he stayed the night. He used to stay night. Oh my goodness. Because I've still got this vision of him because I was at one end of Duncroft because there's back stairs, main stairs, back stairs. And I've got this vision of him coming down the back stairs. I'd come from my end in his little, like, vest thing and his mm. shell suit bottoms. He'd, he used to stay the night. He had his own room, did he? There used to be a guesty bit. I know it's making me shake. <laughs> Who lets a 42 year old man stay in a home with 14, 15, and 16 year old girls? So, the sleeping quarters that you guys were in at night versus where Savile was in at night, he, I'm taking he had access, did he? Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Yep. And did you see people leaving your quarters to go to his room? No, but I, I found out that one of the girls, Diana, name was, um, she'd gone to him because, as I said, we used to brag. <laughs> so she came back, and did she, you know, give some details as to what had happened? Well, she said she'd had full sex with him. <laughs> wow. Um. Yeah, and nobody else had done that. So she was like, oh, I feel sick. Was he using <laughs> the cigarettes and the sweets and whatever else he brought, perfume, Records and, um, to mm. reward girls who came to his room at night, that kind of thing? I don't know. I don't know. Probably. Um <laughs> mm. Did you ever hear of any staff members joking about his behaviour or being aware of his behaviour. No, they thought it was wonderful. This celebrity. <laughs> Same as, Miss, you know, the, the woman that ran the place. They thought it was wonderful. He was doing all what he was doing. Because he, he utilised his charity as a shield, didn't he, and his good deeds as a shield uh -huh. to get into these situations, to get access. Okay, then, so when you're getting taken to Clunk Click... Um, is is are things happening at these shows as well in the changing rooms, etc.? Yeah, afterwards. Afterwards. Yeah. And what was? How would he select girls to go back into his changing rooms? Well, no, there'd only be a, a few of us that had gone um, from Duncroft, so yeah. So, I know. I know. I did, and I know the other girls did as well. So it's like he pre-selected girls to take to the shows that he felt he could get back into the changing rooms. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, make you relive any of this stuff, but are you able to say, just talking in general terms, the extent of what happened in the changing rooms? <laughs> Alcohol. Touching. Inappropriate touching. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, and how often did you, for example, go get invited to the shows? I think I went three times, and then I can remember not being picked one week. Ah, uh, and I was very upset. <laughs> And I think that was when I ran away and never went back. Really? Yeah, March, so 70. What was going through the head, your head, the day you ran away? I wasn't wanted again. Mm -hmm. I was wanted and then I wasn't wanted, so to speak. 
you know, everything else. Um, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got some exciting news to announce. Michael Francis is coming back to tour the UK in 2024. The remade Mantor, the Michael Francis story. Michael Francis, once named one of the 50 most significant mob bosses in the USA by Fortune magazine, and a former member of the notorious Colombo crime family, will take you deep into the world of organized crime, sharing captivating tales and insights into the Mafia's past, present, and future. Join us for an unforgettable evening with Michael Francis, the original Goodfella, as he exclusively sits down with myself, Sean Atwood. With me as the host, there's going to be a no-holes-barred exploration of Michael Francis's life, including his numerous arrests and jury trials that ultimately led to his pleading guilty to a federal racketeering charge, a 10-year prison sentence, and $15 million in restitution. You will have the unique opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session, making this event a must-see for true crime enthusiasts and anyone curious about the underworld. Don't miss this explosive In Conversation with Michael Francis. Live on stage in the UK, this exclusive in-person event will be held in various locations in the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Link in the description box below this video if you want to grab yourself a ticket. Back to the podcast. Cheers. Yeah. It's kind of like a Stockholm syndrome, isn't it? Stockholm. Where people who are kidnapped, sometimes they start to adulate the kidnappers. Because right. you were so young in this situation, you were a minor celebrity is, you know, coming to the school and manipulating all the girls. So I can understand the psychological process of feeling rejected mm. at that point. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and what, did, what did, did you plan to go anywhere specific or? I was hitchhiking all over the country. Oh, you hitchhiked? I did. Okay, and how old are you at this point then? 15. Only 15, still. oh my God. Still 15. I, I was, a couple of times I ran away with a couple of the girls. Terry was one of them and Jill was another one. Um, but this time I went on my own. Um, and I just used to go where the lorry was going. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one time I ended up in Belgium. Oh my goodness. Because you didn't need a passport in those days. Yeah. You did need a passport to get back in though. And were you still self-medicating with alcohol or any other substances at this point? I was self-harming then. I don't know. I'd, I'd started self-harming. Um... I can't remember what age. Um, yeah. And from the self-harm, that went on to anorexia. I was bulimic for years as well. I tried them all. <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> so in your late teens then, did you get in any dangerous situations because you're a young person? On the road, hitchhiking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've slept in derelict buildings with no floors in the middle, up on the third floor, so nobody would find us. But, like, I've, yeah, I've done all sorts. I've slept in horse boxes. Um, huh. I <laughs> They kept trying to get me back as well because I was a care person. They kept trying to get me back until I was 18. And every time they brought me back, I got put in a place in Westgate. Um, I just, I'd, 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 I'd done with it, with the system that had failed me. I was done with it. Um, yeah, and just kept running away and eventually they gave up. But I ended up being put in prison when I was 16. What was the arrest for? I smashed a window in a shop in Westgate, a second-hand shop, and filled my carrier bags with all the second-hand tat. But because no children's home would take me, I got put in Holloway for a few months. I spoke in Holloway a couple of times, and... 
How did you find your first day at Holloway? Was it intimidating? Horrendous. Horrendous. I was in I was in a room with a lady who had killed her husband with a hammer. <laughs> but she ended up being more of a mum to me than my mum had ever been. Wow. In, in those few months that I was in there. She was amazing. She wasn't horrible to me. It wasn't I wasn't the husband, do you know what I mean? So did she look out for you and prevent anyone from bullying you? Um well, you didn't get a lot of time out of your room, so. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I didn't get bullied. I've always sort of, I don't entice, well, it happens to me, but I don't entice it. <laughs> I sort of try and keep myself to myself. How did you find the prison regimen? Hard. Hard, but again, I don't. I, I was prison when I was sixteen. I was prison. I was ball store when I was like eighteen. I was. I've done a couple of prison sentences since then as well. What was the ball for? Um, because they just couldn't do anything with me anymore. I'd like, I'd stolen pop socks, but. I was just so, I know. <laughs> um, and because of all the running away from the children's homes and da 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 da, I was just classed as bad. The bookstore's gonna make me all better. Was that short, sharp shock? Is that oh, what 10 it? months that was. 10 months? Yeah. And was it like run like a boot camp or? Um. No, it's got, there's two ball stores. This one was East Sutton Park at Maidstone. Okay. There was another one called Board Hall, was the one where you went if you'd done like dangerous crimes or whatever and things. So our one was quite like sedate. Big old stately home again. You had your jobs every day. Very anorexic and bulimic while I was there. Horrendous. I can't believe I'd done that for so many years. Did you make any friends? Yes. Yes, I did. I sort of realised that maybe I was gay as well. <laughs> and I'm still not sure about that one, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, I mean, your trust in men must have been just absolutely oh, obliterated. that was before all that. Okay. That was when I was 19. Okay. Um... But no, that came after. <laughs> well, no, there was a few things already, isn't there? Yeah, yeah there's been a few. Um, but yeah, sorry, I do justify things, don't I? So you've made some friends in the Borstal. Mm -hmm. You've got your routine going. Mm -hmm. and, and that came in to an end after 10 months, did you say? Yeah, I've done 10 months there. Where were you released to? Uh, Margate. Back to Margate. With nothing. So how did you survive there? I was very lucky. I mean, they let you out. They give you, like, a few pounds. Nowhere to live. Um, I actually met this lovely lady. I don't know where she came from, Maggie. She offered me to stay at her place, which is what I did. And I started, mm -hmm. I'd done a college course. Oh. Went to college. Didn't complete that one, though. I found it hard to, com to complete things. What fine. course was it? Um, <laughs> typing and things because I always wanted to be like my mother. Mm. Why? <laughs> Why? I don't understand it. She was a secretary, so I wanted to be like her. Pedestal. She was up on a pedestal and she was so awful to me. Um, but it sounds like you're going through a better period of your life at this point. Yes. And did that last? What do you mean? Did it start to go dark again? So you 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 you're doing the college course and you're getting your back self back on track. Sorry, I thought it was on about my mum still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did it? Did that last? Or did uh, it? No, I got met my partner and got pregnant. <laughs> How old? I was twenty one when I had my first daughter. How did you meet him? A nightclub. Mm. And was it a good choice or was he? It's 
okay? It was, a, it was okay. So he wasn't abusive like previous experiences. Oh, no, no, no. We, we, no. No, no. no. <laughs> um, but it's young to have a, a baby, isn't it? <sighs> a lot of pressure on a relationship. Well, I'd been very, I've got to say, I've been very lucky up till then, Sean. Mm. I'd never taken a contraceptive in my life. Mm. And I'd managed to get all the way up to 21. Yeah. Or 20 before I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. So there for goodness. Imagine me 15 and having a baby. Oh my God. Even 21, how did you cope? Hard. Because by then my head was completely shot away. Completely. I can't I can't explain how my head was. When you um, say that, do you think is that because things from the past were surfacing in your head? Yeah, they just hadn't gone away, you know. There's a constant I had a constant tight jaw. Constant. I couldn't get it to relax at yeah. At all. And I don't get that now, thank God. Mm. But yeah, it was horrendous. Like how anxious and stressed out I was. What was the question? Sorry. So I'm, I'm trying to ascertain what your family life was like having a boyfriend and a baby. I mean, did it give you, you know, when you hold your baby and you have that feeling of love, was that something new for you and was it a warm feeling or had your emotions been shut down so much by what had happened in your past you couldn't respond fully and properly? Um... Oh, God. <laughs> That's hard. I could respond properly. I actually realised what I'd done five weeks into having the baby. <sighs> oh, I don't want my girl. <laughs> That's okay. Your boyfriend at the time, was he able to provide for you and take that pressure away from you? Our relationship was terrible. I'd come from where I'd come from and was at the point where I did. I never spoke about feelings. I never spoke about what was going on. I don't know how he'd got to where he was. He was the same. All the time we were going out, going up to London for the weekend, doing our stuff. It was fine. Seven months in, I found out I'm pregnant. And, well, it, it changed for me, obviously. It had to. But it didn't really change too much on his side. <laughs> um, I don't know. How long did that relationship last for? Oh, we would discover till my daughter was two and a half. And why did that relationship finish? Because we were, we had started to hit each other by then. Mm. Um, the anger that was coming out of me, I don't, I don't know where it was coming from. But it was anger, like, all the time, especially if I drank. Oh, my God, if I drank. <sighs> but, yeah, we were together. Like, what, seven, so two, four and a half years, is it? So that's taking you up to about 25, is it 26? No. <laughs> I had to work that one out. Um, so I met him when I was nine. Yeah, I met him when I was nineteen, I think. So, or twenty, nineteen, twenty. At my twenty-first while I was with him. Kelly was born the following year, so twenty-two. We split up when she was two and a half. Okay. And well, how was your life after you guys split up? What we what? How did your living situation change? I. It was very easy to rent places in those days. I mean, I, I think I had a choice of about three different houses that I could rent and I just rented this house and we settled down into me and her life <laughs> for, for a while. 
And then I met another partner. How did you meet him? A club. <laughs> Goodness. He was actually a taxi driver and he used to come to the club at the end of the night when he'd finished work, like at the end of the night, and I got talking to him through that. But I was with, he was fine, no abuse or anything, really good. I was with him for two years and then he went, I don't want to be with somebody who's got a child. Mm. Okay. So, yeah, another one. Um, yeah, things went a little bit haywire after that. Is that because you were heartbroken and just rejection again? Yeah, and. How dare you tell me that, you know, after two years, you don't want to be with somebody who's got a child when you knew all along that I had one. Yeah. Um, so how did you address that rejection? Do you go to alcohol? Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> so much so that I'd be fast asleep when my daughter would come home from school. Oh, dear. In the days when the pub shut at half past two, of course. And was there anyone that you could turn to for help at that point in your life? The people that lived downstairs, Catherine and Ron, I think the names were. They used to help. But no, I didn't know how to make friends and keep them. I found it really hard to like make relationships and keep them and that that was a pattern was it throughout your 20s um yeah I decided a couple of years after, after split split with the last boyfriend that I wanted another baby I was on my own listening to myself saying this now I really want to say Oh, my God, you stupid cow. What did you think you were doing? Do you know what I mean? But I can't. <laughs> but, yeah, I decided I wanted another baby. And that's what I did. How old? I was 28 when I had Roxanne. And were things stable again then? No, it had never been stable all the way through. <laughs> um, <laughs> even the pregnancy, do you know what I mean? Thought it was somebody else's baby when it wasn't, and God, that caused so many issues. Because one of them was black and one of them was white. Um <laughs> Something you'd read about in a book, hey? Okay? <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, you are writing a book, so we, we may be reading about it. Oh, wow. So continued stress, that's what you're saying. Constant anxiety, headaches, jaw ache, no amount of alcohol or... Had I done any drugs by then? I tried when I was about 20... Six, I think. Didn't like it. And we we had tried things back before I'd had Kelly, but didn't like that either. <laughs> but never really been a taking drugs person. I was I didn't know people at the time. What was your life like, Sheila, when you got to thirty? Um <laughs> I think that was coming up to me being on the Oh, my goodness. How did you get introduced to Brown? My partner. And that was a, a new partner, is it, at the time? Yeah, Roxanne was four months old when I met him because I was on my own when I had Roxanne. She, she was four months old when I met him. Yeah. And he doesn't like me talking about this. So what we found through these interviews, I'm, I'm going to call it brown because YouTube doesn't mm -hmm. like the other word, mm -hmm. um, is that people have been traumatised, uh, childhood trauma, they're not given the tools to deal with these things. They, 
end up living very chaotic lives mm. as a consequence of the evil behavior of these perpetrators. And there comes a point where they discover things that can block out the pain. And the brown, many of our podcast guests have told us over and over again that the brown is the one that blocks out the pain the most. I was out there when I first did it. I still remember it because it just, all that clamp, it took all that clamp away. It took all that tight jaw away. Everything just went like that. And that was, you never got that again. <laughs> That's the one, isn't it? But as a consequence of that, then what our guests tell us is that the brown slowly takes over their lives because they've got to finance the habit and they get into criminality. And as they're doing it over time, the side effects are kicking in more as well. Did you find those things happened? It doesn't take long. It doesn't take long. I can remember, because I got into it in Margate. When I lived in Margate. And then we lost our house. I ended up in one room for 21 months. Um... Sorry, I lost my point there. And then came here, moved here. I forgot what you said. I'm so sorry. Yes, we were talking about the consequences of getting involved in the brown. And you said those consequences kicked in quite fast in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Within a couple of weeks, like when you stop taking it, you can't stop taking it. How did you feel when you stopped? It's horrible. It's horrible. It's worse than any flu or... Physically, mentally. Physically, mentally. You feel sick. You've got water coming out your bum. It's like, it's horrendous. And within a couple of weeks, you can get that. And the only thing I knew what to do was to go and get some more and take the pain away. How long did that cycle continue for? Were... You had to keep going going to get more to take away the pain. Well, the whole period of when I was on heroin, I was trying to work it out to tell my daughter the other week. It it was about three and a half years. But I had prison in between that. And what was the prison for that time? <laughs> Forgery. Was that to finance the brown? Forty three charges and grief yeah i back to holloway no no there's a bit of a story leading up to it because i'd i kept getting caught i kept getting caught i kept getting caught and having children being a single mum yeah they kept letting me off letting me off and then the last time i had to go to holloway there was no choice what was Holloway like this time? <laughs> Completely different. Completely different. When you've got kids, it's completely different. Um, and that was the new Holloway, because the first time I was there was the old Holloway. The second time I was there was the old Holloway, and then this time was the new Holloway. It's another world. It is another world. People keeping people the noise going all night, screaming, banging, people cutting themselves, hurting themselves. Oh. When you say it's people, um, people, because it's a female prison, mm. do you mean like male staff members or do no. you mean females using things on females? Females, because <laughs> when people bring drugs in, they put them where the sun don't shine. <laughs> and the girls, the girls to get it out of them. I've seen it happening. Yeah, that happens in the male prisons as well now. Yeah. To get, they go in there and get it out, extract it. Yeah. Sick. Mm. So don't go to prison, any young people watching this. This is one of the things <laughs> yeah. that uh, you can look forward to if you do end up in prison. Oh, God, I yeah. could tell a lot more about that as well. Oh, please do. It's just, it's, honestly, it's, you, you, you don't know. It's, it's like a world in its, on its own. Um... And working in the prisons, I ended up working on the gardens in the prisons. I, um, and some of the stuff that gets thrown out the windows. 
is absolutely everything. Everything gets thrown out the windows. Everything that comes out of every orifice come, goes out the windows and it's disgusting. And, and does someone have to clean that up? We used to have to clean it up. We used to have to clean it up and dirty needles and everything. And honestly, it's, well, it's, it's not even fit for animals. It wasn't. Was there a hierarchy? Um, there was sides, because again, and I hate to say this, there was black and there was white. In America, it's all racially divided. Yeah. Yeah. And that was all them years ago. Um, I didn't get involved with the stuff to find out about the hierarchy I went and done what I needed to do. I ended up working outside the prison as well, um, which was wonderful. (laughs) What was your job? Just doing the gardens. Gardens. I used to track the visitors up and (laughs) get cigarettes and beers and things. (laughs) Were you you able to quit the brown while you were in prison? I did, yeah. But it was probably available, wasn't it, in prison? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I didn't try. I, I had no... No way of getting money for anything. I had no money for private spends or whatever, so there was no way I was going to... How bad was the come down cold turkey (laughs) in prison from the brown? What, when you're taking about £250 worth a day? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I was in the hospital wing for a good week. It's weeks. It's weeks and weeks. But and they don't give you any well, I don't suppose they would give you anything, would they? They give you like minute something that's not gonna touch the sides. I had a cellmate in America and um he'd been arrested hundred and fifty plus times for small offences to finance the brown mm-hmm. and he was cold turkey and he was sleeping with his eyes open when he did finally get to sleep. He wouldn't sleep for days. He was pooing himself and his hair was falling out. Wow. So I can't imagine what you must have gone through mm. of having lived with someone and seen it firsthand. Mm. Mm. It is horrendous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, for the grace of God, I got out of it. I... How many days does it take to go through the withdrawal? It's not days. It's not days. When I went into rehab... Um, I think it took me about near on six weeks before I could sleep, like, without the pain. It's like, it's like constant pain in your muscles and everything. It's, it's horrendous. And is that the key point where you're tempted to go back to stop that pain? And how did you stop yourself from going back? I don't know. Because I was in rehab two and a half miles up the road. I could have quite easily walked, well, maybe a bit more than two and a half miles, but it's only a couple of miles up the road. I could have quite easily walked. I didn't want that. Good. I'd had enough. I was hitting myself on the days where I didn't take the head because I didn't want to be taking it anymore. I was trying to hit myself and I couldn't even do that because it would hurt because I was so annoyed at myself. For, I knew I'd have to, have to go and get it again. I just knew. So you made a conscious decision just to go cold turkey, not go back to it? Many a times. Okay, so this is the first of many times. Yeah. Um, Did anything else happen in Holloway, any notable stories from your time there this time? My underwear was stolen. They stole your underwear? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think. You're in a prison, you're in it with thieves, don't we? Nothing worse than a jailhouse thief. <laughs> my underwear was on the radiator and when I come back it all gone and I learnt my lesson big time. <laughs> you didn't go door to door? No, I didn't it's go got looking. my bloody knickers. <laughs> I didn't go looking at all, I just let it be. Yeah. But no, just just the, 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 the way people are with each other as well in there, it's like... Nasty. I I'd, had I'd one instance when I was on the phone to my girls, and I've got three girls, so I have to speak to each of them. Somebody behind me, like, hurry up. And I think that was one of the only times when I retaliated. 
Um, I don't do that very often, but I retaliated. And What method of retaliation did you employ? Just my mouth, <laughs> saying that I was speaking to my children and I had three of them. If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a thousand people now and we selected ten of the hardest hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests. Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino crime family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink McDonald, £6 million bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, international smuggler's tie death row prison escape, John Abbott, San Quentin prison shootout and escape. Michael Francis, Colombo crime family capo portrayed in Goodfellas. And Wildman, English enforcer in Arizona prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023. So check that out as well. It will be available worldwide on Amazon. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Uh. And she did carry on, so I couldn't really hear what I was saying anyway, but it's horrible in there. Was there any, was the famous killers in there at that point in time as well? I met Mara Henley. Did you? When I was 16. What was she like? I was, it. I don't know. That She only briefly came into the workroom. Yeah. Someone grabbed hold of her and smashed her face against the wall Dang. and she was gone again. So people who commit crimes against kids like that, then are they at the lowest point of the hierarchy yeah. and they get attacked by the prisoners? Yeah. Yeah. What about Rose West? Was she around? No. I don't know. There was one at Bullwood Hall, Carol something, mm. who'd oh, chopped the children up and put them in suitcases and sent them back to the parents. I never met her. I just heard about her. I know. Did you ever uh, inquire as to the backstory as to what she, why she said she'd done that? <laughs> no, I'd no. love, I'd love to go and have a chat with her and ask <laughs> her. And believe me, um, yeah, I don't know, but yeah. So you got out of Holloway sober. What year was that? Uh ninety-three. Ninety-three. Hmm. And you're in your thirties. Mm -hmm. You got your three kids. Mm -hmm. And did things go back to normality? <laughs> oh wow! I feel like a bit of a failure here, but this is the way it went. I came home from prison. We'd not li long lived in this house when I'd gone to prison, so we had no carpets, hardly nothing. I'd had squatters in here when I was in prison. I came home in the November. The only thing I knew how to do that would get Christmas sorted out, because I got one birthday just before Christmas and Christmas, was to go back to what I was doing before, the forgery. So I went back to the forgery, got Christmas sorted out, and then suddenly thought, well, I'll just try a little £10 bag. Yeah. One is too many. And a thousand's never enough. So I was back on that. And it took me, didn't take me that long to get back to doing what I was doing before. It's, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's like, oh. Did that lead to another rest? Yes. And back to Holloway? No, I, oh. yeah, I was very lucky. Lucky is the word. Um, I was scared of going back to prison again. I was scared of leaving my girls again. They were beginning, they weren't trusting me, you know, and all this stuff. Um, so I went to my doctor and I pulled my sleeves up and I put my arms on his desk and I just said, help me. And he looked at my arms because I wasn't very good at injecting. I'd resorted to injecting by then. He looked at my arms and picked up the phone, phoned his friend at the rehab up the road. 
got me an appointment that afternoon. <laughs> and, you know, I still made the excuse when he said that to me. He said, you can go over there now. And I was like, I can't. And I come out with some excuse because I had to go and get some more brown before I went for this appointment. Otherwise, I wouldn't have lasted the rest of the day. But I went for the appointment. They accepted me. And then I had seven weeks, the longest seven weeks of my life, trying not to get caught, taking my consumption right down because I was trying not to get caught. Um, and, yeah, suffering because of that, not as bad as stopping it completely, but still suffering. Yeah, seven weeks. Were your daughters allowed to visit you? Not the first week. We were, um, um, I've actually got a picture upstairs of my first visit with them. Mm -hmm. And did they help yeah. to inspire you to be strong? My youngest, I mean, my eldest was amazing. Oh. She took over mum role, and I've been able to thank her for this as well because she did. My youngest came to see me one day in rehab, and she went to me, that was then, this is now, and tomorrow's another day. Oh. And she was only six. <laughs> oh, shout out to your daughter if you <laughs> yeah. watch this. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I was like, oh, my God. You know, it's just, it's so true. That saying was so true because I wanted to do it for them. So you you got clean in this centre. I was there for five months. Five months. And what was your life like when you got out? Um. Well, I didn't have my children all back in one go. Because a social worker said to me, like, I think it's probably best if you do bit by bit, get used to it. Because she said, I think if you have more... Okay. Sorry, I told okay. you I'd do that with my hands. I've been trying not to move <laughs> them. Um, she said, I think you have them back all in one go. It's going to be too much. So my eldest came back. And then one of the youngest ones would come back one day. And then one the other, another day. And we sort of worked, worked our way back into it. Um... And, yeah, it was okay. It took me a lot to try and build up their trust in me. I mean, my eldest daughter struggled with me trying to tell her what to do now when I hadn't been. Um, but we, we got over that. We got over that. But yeah. So you were reunited with them, mm -hmm. and then... Was it another relapse or was you done with it? Not him. Good. Not him. Good. No. No, tell a lie. They let me out for a couple of days and I went up to London with one of the rich people that I was in rehab with. Sorry to say it like that, but I have to because he bought some hair. Mm. And that's what I was saying earlier, that I'm glad I wasn't rich. Yeah. Because he could. And I had a bit then. And it was horrible because it didn't do nothing. Mm. And I was like, well, what was the point of that? I've waited five months to like try that little bit and it didn't do anything, so I never touched it again. Thank goodness for that. But that person is dead now, I might oh add. Oh, my God. Again, the consequences of um, the brown. <sighs> yeah. If people are watching this, it's, um, people can go downhill fast and die fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's horrible. So what was your life like once you completely quit then? Was it better? It was hard. It was hard. It was hard. Because if you're not on anything, you're demons, you're, you're facing things that are coming up sober, you've got to face them. Was that a challenge? It was. Um, I started smoking. <laughs> so with the green... Mm. Did, did that relax you then and reduce your anxiety? It meant I could sleep yep. <laughs> a bit better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it took some of the pain away in my body and things. Um, but yeah. Would you say you became dependent on it? N not then. I didn't. 
because I then went to college and I can remember being at college and listening to the woman talking and everybody else saying, yeah, you said that last week, miss, blah, blah, blah. And I sat there thinking, I don't remember that. And then I clicked. <laughs> so I stopped smoking it again okay. <laughs> while I was at college. <laughs> so I could remember what was said the week before. <sighs> um, had these substances meant that alcohol had been shelved or were you, was alcohol still involved? No, alcohol came back in. Came back in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not. No, I'm not even going to say that. Not badly, because it's all bad. Um, yeah. I thought I was okay. <laughs> I've always, you... Sorry, I've always looked after myself, do you know what I mean? And I was doing it again. I thought I was okay. <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, self-medicating for the trauma until you get the professional help, is, is, this is what happens. What would you say your life was like at the turn of the millennium? 2000. Yeah. I was with my last partner, the one who I said I can't find in the book hard to write about because he didn't only mess with me, he messed with my children's heads as well. Oh dear. Um, yeah, I shouldn't have been in the relationship. But I couldn't get out of it. Was he uh, threatening, abusive, uh, intimidating? Yeah, it became like that, yeah. How long were you with him? Five years. And how, was it okay in the beginning, but it, it, it turned? It was wonderful in the beginning. Of course it was. It was absolutely wonderful. He'd done everything by the book. Even my birthday, because he knew that I shouldn't be drinking, he got me like non-alcoholic champagne and things, mm. you know what I mean? It yeah. really touched me. Oh. But then he moved in. And it went bad as soon as he moved in? Not as soon as he moved in. I found out he was smoking cannabis. I, I hadn't smoked it. I'd stopped again. I, and um, I found out he was smoking cannabis. And he knew that what I'd been through and how I didn't want it around me. Um, so that sort of put a spanner in the works. Um, and he started to take over. Controlling. Yeah, with me. He tried doing it with the kids. One of them moved out. The other one used to say back to him, wouldn't let him get away with it. Yeah. Did he resort to physical violence? Not with them. But with you? Mm. And how frequent was that? Oh, God. We were always splitting up because of it. And the police were being called and... So Towards had, the end, a lot. So you had a few years of hell. There's a lot of anxiety involved as well by then. Sorry, I forgot to mention that one. And that didn't, you know, people, you see them dancing and smiling. But you, guys were hit, <laughs> you guys were beating each other up on it, were you? Oh, we used to go out. <laughs> it was when we, he used to go one way and I used to go up another way when we'd go out. And it was when we come back here that okay. the problems used to be. Yeah. But, um... God, it was such a dysfunctional relationship and I just, I couldn't get out of it. How did you eventually get out of it? Aha. I, I had psychotherapy with a lovely lady and um, I had it in a group setting, first of all, and then I had it on my own for a year and at the end of it, she said, well, what are you going to do? Because I'd gone back to working in pubs, which what, what I know. You know, working in pubs, being a waitress and that. And um, she said, I've got a friend who works at a drug and alcohol agency. I can get you an appointment to go and see them about getting into involuntary work. There you go. I got in this voluntary. Within a couple of months, I was working in the office because I'd done the course at college with the typing and everything. It took me about three months and I'd got rid of him. So with the therapy then, <laughs> did the therapist get into the root causes and did Savile come up? That was before it had even come out. And I was, um, with the therapist I'm on about? Yeah, the one, this was 1990, 
Hold on, when did I meet Ian? 96? Did you, seven? Did you disclose to the therapist the, the, your, your abusers? That's what I'm trying to get at. My uncle? Yeah, you talked about that. And the Yeah. But not Jimmy Savile. Okay. I used to brag about it, one of my friends has told me. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. We shared a house in Cliftonville when we were 19, and she said, I used to brag about it. Which you explained that, you know, earlier why why that was. We understand that. Mm. All right, so you managed to get out of this relationship. Is that a weight off your shoulders? Yeah. Yeah, because he used to turn up at the back door of where I was working and tell my boss that I had all drugs in my car and things. Right. <laughs> and my boss would call me up to the office and she'd go, oh, please tell him to go away. <laughs> like, stop pestering us. Oh, he was a dick. How did you really finally was. completely get him out of your life then? If he was just stalking you? Just stuck with what I said mm. for a change. Yeah. My, one of my friends used to say to me, because I say, we'd split up. Mm. And he'd go, oh, no, we'll be coming back down the road with a bunch of flowers and some chocolates <sighs> and you'll take him back. <laughs> and it did. That's what used to happen because mm. I was weak. And because he'd promised me that he would get help and he would do this and do that, and I believe I wanted to believe him. Yeah. All right, so we, so we've gone up, we've gone past the millennium now. What was your life like before you got the letter from Sorry, Please? What was it in the years prior to that? So where was we? Ninety seven to two thousand. Um, well, obviously I was working then. I've never had a, I don't know if it's the right word, proper job. See, I've always done weights in bar, bar work, worked on the fields. Um, I used to do knitting for a company in London. <laughs> it's a car, I've done all sorts. So to have this proper job was wonderful. And I started off as a volunteer and I'd done four months as a volunteer. Then I got a job in the office. I'd done that for two years. Then I got a job in harm reduction, um, starting up a needle exchange and all sorts of stuff. Then I got another job in getting people into work that had been on drugs and alcohol and things. And then that sort of came to an end in 2007. Um had a bit of a breakdown. Was there anything specifically that triggered that or was it in just an internal explosion? Well, I think having two jobs for 10 years didn't help. So you got <laughs> compounded pressure. Yeah, and my stepdad died. Uh, I had a fall at work and I was meant to be doing the London Marathon and I had this fall on my knees at work, so I couldn't do that. My last daughter left home. My friend got cancer of her nose. And then my daughter's dad got murdered. Oh, my goodness. In seven months. And I don't remember a lot about the latter part of that year. <laughs> so if your daughter's dad got murdered, mm. did that give you fear for your daughter? Was it a situation that... Could present danger to your daughter as oh, well. Oh no, 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 no. She, she, she worked for Thomas Cook at the time and was abroad. This was, this was in Ramsgate. Okay. This happened in Ramsgate. We weren't together or anything. So. Okay. But no, um, and it was just all too much. And did that make you want to relapse into any of the previous behaviours? white let's call it white <laughs> and was this the first time you'd come across white or was no. it no and how no. bad did the use of the white get just about all my redundancy money went on it oh no um yeah it got it got me through that five months i don't think i would be here now so it could have saved your life because you were self-medicating. Yeah, because I'd just, I'd had it with it all. 
seriously. I'd had it years before, but now I'd really, I couldn't. And it got me through. And were people in your life that were enabling the white behaviour? I know, I know quite a few people that were taking it. So how did you extricate yourself from that environment? Um, I don't know. It just sort of, well, money and things as well. The, the financial pressure. Yeah. Um, and I'd had enough. I didn't like it. It was, um, I wanted something to shut my brain down. I wanted something to stop me thinking. Yeah. It wasn't the one. <laughs> because there's a lot of diminishing returns on these things, isn't there? The first time you take it, the pleasure is very high. Mm -hmm. But once you start hammering it, the pleasure just goes down and then the mm -hmm. pain and the side effects rise, don't mm -hmm. they? To get the point where you're sick of it. Yep. Yeah. I think that's where I got yeah. with it. And I can't remember the last time I took it now. It was quite a few years, well, eight or nine years ago, I think. Um, so it's me that's 65. So where was your mindset then prior to the 16th of October, Operation U Tree, the letter? What what was your life like um, in, 20, in 2013 and the months before that? It was, it was awful. It was awful. I'd been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. My, my arthritis had kicked in like big time. I'd been diagnosed with one more mental health disorder then and um yeah however my daughter worked for thomas cook so i used to get all these lovely holidays that used to cost me a flight oh, <laughs> and i used to go over there and she'd be working and yeah i just Sunbathe all day <laughs> can, can you take us through the day of the 16th before the letter arrived, do you remember that day? I do. Very well. <laughs> exactly. Do you want it in detail? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. I used to have a computer table here with a desktop on it. And I was sitting at the computer, doing stuff on the computer. And I heard the postman come. So, because I'm so nosy, I had to get up straight away and have a look. <laughs> um, and I opened this one letter thinking what the heck's this like white envelope and whatever what the heck's this ah, and when I saw Surrey Police first of all I thought I'd done something wrong <laughs> oh, oh my god I've been in trouble for years <laughs> do you know what I mean <laughs> I'm like, oh, what have I done <sighs> um, but no then I started reading it and it said about they wanted to Speak to me about my time at Duncroft when Jimmy Savile used to visit. Um, and by then I was shaking so much, like, I just, I, I, I couldn't read the letter because it sort of, it was strange because all my life, that's been okay. What happened? That's, you know, that was okay. Everybody else done it. We were all doing it. It was okay. And now all of a sudden, it's not okay. So that letter, you're reading it, you start shaking. Mm. What happened in your brain? Was it like a response? Um, I wanted to find my friend. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. Which friend? <laughs> my friend Jackie. Well, had she been in Duncroft? No. But she was like no, no. a confidant or something? Yeah. I just wanted to speak to her and I tried to get hold of her because I didn't know what to think. I was like, it was, it, it, yeah, it was it was confusing as well as like, oh, my God, because I knew by that time of my life that what had happened was wrong, you know. <laughs> At the time I didn't, but now I do. Um, yeah, and I couldn't get hold of her and I was pacing round because you can go all the way round in here, so it's good for pacing. Um I don't know what I was thinking. My head hurt. 
my head to hurt because I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know, you know. How would you describe the pain in your head? Like a hurricane, like an explosion, like a headache? No, a clamp. A clamp. Yeah. Like a clamp on your head that's tightened and tightened. <laughs> and did you feel it all coming up from the past? Duncraft? No. Not yet. I'd blocked it so much, there was no way it was just all going to, like, come out like that. Right. It was... But the letter had put a focus on where it was <laughs> locked up, would you say? Well... What do they say about opening a can of worms? Mm. I didn't say that. I said I was opening a can of snakes. That's, yeah, that's what I would say because that's what I felt was coming. Were you able to call your friend? Was she available? I finally got hold of her. She was shopping. What, what did you sell her? <laughs> I was like, you know, I, I can't remember what I actually said to her, but I like, told her. I think I actually went over there. Yeah. Did you show her the letter? Yeah. Do you still have the letter? Oh, of course. All right, we'll have to have a look at that after oh, if that's available. Of course. <laughs> what, was she supportive then? Yeah, she was wonderful. She was wonderful. And from subsequently from that, I had three police forces wanted to come and interview me. All right, let's slow down. Yeah. <laughs> what was your initial response to the police for the first letter then? I was worried. Did, was there a phone number to call? Was it was it an email address to respond to? <sighs> yeah, there was an email. I think it was a phone number. I do you know one of the first things I done was try to get hold of a solicitor. Okay. Why? <laughs> mm. Well, I do know why, but like, mm. I don't know that that evening, I actually emailed a solicitor. So my brain must have been like, wow, this is happening. Do you know what I mean? This yeah. is all coming out now. So you thought oh. you needed to get some kind of legal protection before mm. you responded, or some advice at least, before you responded to the mm. police. That makes sense. And then when you did finally respond to the police, what method did you use? Um, I think I found them. And the lady that I actually got dealing with my case, Sam Bambury, her name was. She was lovely. She was lovely. She's actually gone to work with children now that have been abused. Oh, She's God. left left the police and done that. So, <sighs> um, but yeah, she she was amazing. Uh, they came sort of two days afterwards to do the first interview. But sorry, please. Yeah. And they were people who were warm and understanding. Yeah. But, and we done it in my friends. We didn't do it here. I didn't want it done here. <laughs> okay. And were they females? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and was that experience... Glad you asked that. Would you say that experience um, was a positive one for you or did you have to relive things? Mm. I know this is a cop-out, but because, again, I cut everything off, Things wouldn't hit me for like a day or two, and yeah. then a day or two later, it'd be like, "Whoa!" From it. Um, plus, I was drinking quite a lot then as well. So, yeah. So that was one of the police forces. After that first <laughs> visit, did the, that police force, sorry, offer you any psychological assistance or counselling? I think there's something on the letter, but I ended up going to the centre in Canterbury. Mm. I got my own. No, I didn't. I had CBT first. Then I went to the centre. Yeah, because I had high intensity CBT after that. So, How long were they here for that first visit? Sorry, oh, please. goodness. A few hours. <laughs> so they had a lot of questions. Was it was it hard to answer the questions? Yeah, I was just doing what had happened. And then every now and again, they'd stop me and ask me things. Yeah. But it was a lot. Mm -hmm. Like from 
they do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so when they left, then and then um, you said that did they come back? or Was it a different jurisdiction? No, I had sorry, please for the Duncroft one. Yeah. I had Lewisham police for the rape. That was the uncle. No, that was the three. Oh, yeah. Men. Um, three men, yeah. And I declined that one. The uncle. And then Hampshire police for my uncle. Okay, gotcha. I couldn't deal with the Jimmy Savile one and my uncle one and the other one as well. It's <laughs> a lot like, on your plate, isn't it? Yeah. So... Can I just tell you as well, yes. the, the video video interview I had mm -hmm. in June 2015 over in Canterbury in a house in Spring Lane was with two men. Oh. And was that a bad experience for you? That's terrible. You think there'd be more understanding to people's Well, I'm like this. I'm sitting there and I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going yeah, like yeah. this. Ooh. Yeah. Give me microphone. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I couldn't look at them. It was like, I knew I had to do it, but, oof. So, but no. I had no idea the magnitude of all of these cases, the pressure. So, what what happened? Did they get, end up in court, any of these cases? My uncle got charged. He got charged. Because they also contacted my cousin. She corroborated. Who gave the same, same story as me, but we haven't spoke for 50, 60 years or whatever wow. it was, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah, he was charged. But they did tell me that he wasn't very well. It's no excuses, it's pathetic. They're just assisting. <laughs> yeah. Dare you be unwell. How convenient. I know. See these guys get wheeled in, caught with the oxygen mask just so they can get off the case. Oh, look at Freddie Starr. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that one didn't, there was, he didn't do a day in prison, I take it, the uncle. No, he died. He died. What about the other two um, police jurisdictions? Were they, did they become criminal matters for you? D sorry, the one. Yeah. No, I've never done anything about that. And then with um, Sorry Police. I never went back about it, I mean. With Sorry Police, was that, did that pr progress? Duncroft. Yeah. Yeah. And well, how did that progress? What was the natural next steps? Um, so you gave your statement. <laughs> yeah. They came back a few times or... I spoke to her quite a bit, Sam. She, um, you know, we'd email and things. Yeah. Um, and she was there if I needed any questions. Oh, mm -hmm. That was something that happened as well. I found a picture of me and Jimmy Savile. What? I couldn't even remember being taken. Oh, my goodness. And I had to send it to Sam of a picture of me when I was 16. And I sent it to her and I said, is this me? <laughs> I, was, I was so, I don't know, shocked, gobsmacked. I don't remember the picture being taken. Wow. It's going on the front of my book. Yeah, good oh. idea. <laughs> what do you reckon? Definitely, <laughs> yes. Jim fixed it for me. <laughs> sorry, my sense of humour is sick sometimes. So what What did, the, um, sorry, please tell you then, did they say, you know, this is, this is, um, going to go to court or he's dead and there's nothing we could do. I mean, what, what, how was it progressing? And you said that U Tree Operation U Tree, 16th of October, 2013, the letter rise, but the operation progresses quite fast into your life now, does it? Mm. Yeah. From speaking to sorry, please. And doing one statement about everything. Um, to then speaking to Lewisham police about when I was then speaking to Hampshire police about when I was abused as a small child. Um, yeah. <laughs> How did things progress with Sorry Police? Um, I think I sort of passed a lot of it over to the solicitor. Um because I was finding it very hard to, like, process actually what had happened for me and how everything had changed 
Um, so I think, yeah. Well, how was your mind adapting to this then? Was there a bit of shock in the beginning? And then like you go into the clouds a bit, but then you come back out and perhaps uh, relief that there's an explanation of, you know, and that other people have identified this monster. I was in shock because then I, st I don't watch the news. Um, then I started like watching the news and things and um, luckily I got away just after all this happened. I, I ended up going to my daughter. Thomas in, Cook. Yeah, <laughs> for 29 days. Ooh. But while I was over there, even it would come up on the TV when I'd be sitting there and sit three in the in the bar or whatever. Um, I didn't realise what big thing it had been going on for a year, and I didn't even realise. How did that make you feel when you saw it just getting bigger and bigger in front of your eyes? I was shocked. I was shocked. Um, yeah, I thought it was just us. <laughs> I thought we were we were the only ones and had you been in contact with any of the Duncroft girls over the years? Mm, Kerry but only because of this. So it came about because of this. Yeah. After you tree. Well, she she asked me to speak to her solicitor because of Freddie Star thing. So was she a victim of Star and Savile? Yeah. Okay. And she was the one that wasn't believed in 2009. Yeah, I remember when that. When she went to the police. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually spoke to a solicitor and told her what I knew about Freddie Star and that. So that backed her up then? Yeah, I was fuming that he was suing her. How dare he? He was suing her? Yeah. Freddie Star was suing Kerry. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> like oh. <laughs> but, um, and what was the out? What, what was the outcome of the Freddie Star? He, he passed away, didn't he? So. Oh, he passed away. Mm. Mm. Um, did she get compensated from his side? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. We haven't spoke. All right. So this is like the biggest story in the world right now unfolding in front of your eyes. You've gone off on a nice little Thomas Cook. <laughs> holiday mm -hmm. but you can't it's inescapable it's everywhere mm -hmm. did, did it change your life in any way um <laughs> i don't know it did when i got the compensation <laughs> okay good that's good was that was it a struggle to get that or was oh, it easy oh it went on for a bit i got nothing from jimmy savile by the way no nothing what? Nothing at all. <gasps> His money went on whatever it went on. <sighs> I got money from mine. The BBC, my solicitors got more money than I got from the BBC. And that was to do with Freddie Starr, was it, not Savile? No, it was the time I was at the BBC in the, in the changing rooms. Freddie Starr wasn't there that time. All right, so... Just to clarify this, because it gets complex, doesn't it? Mm. So, Savile's estate was paying victims, were they? No. no. Savile's estate was paying solicitor's fees and things. So it was just a shakedown then? Yeah. Um, you said the BBC, did they have to pay victims of Savile separately? Yeah. And that's where your claim was authorised, was yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And was that, was that hard to get that claim processed? Um, again, the solicitor's done most of it. Did it take years? Uh, when did I get it? No, because I went to Australia in 2015. So, I, man I managed to get to Australia twice in my grandson's first year of life. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's quite quick for the legal system, isn't it? It was, wasn't it? 2015. Yeah. Oh, no, that yeah, it was just after that, actually. And my daughter lent me some money so I could go the first time. So it was just after that. But it was 2015. And was there anywhere else that Savile victims could claim from? Or was it just the Savile Estate and the BBC? Um, and did you have a separate claim against Freddie Starr yourself? No. Okay. No. Did you have claims against any other uh, figures who'd been involved with Savile? 
No. Okay. And the purpose of Utree was what? Because he was dead, he couldn't be brought to justice. What was the purpose of it? Was it just to give victims a voice, to compensate them, to acknowledge the evil deeds? I think they had to do, they had to call it something because there were so many cases coming up, wasn't it? Yeah. It had to have a name. They couldn't keep saying, like, you know, Jimmy Savile Duncroft or Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville. It had to have a name, I suppose. Were they looking for Savile accomplices, perhaps, to prosecute them? Is that what part of U-Tree was about? And isn't that how Freddie yeah, Starr and, and Rolf them. Harris and all these other, yeah. Max Clifford and all these other and, people? What was the other one? Oppo- um, Harry Glitter. Opportunity Knocks, not Opportunity Knocks. Oh, Stuart It's a knockout. Oh, yeah. Sure, was it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was him as well. He came up, didn't he? Now, one of the things that our research has led us to that we've put, I think, in our Savile documentary, Untouchable, is that the Duncroft girls had a forum online where they started to chat about Savile. Oh, uh, yeah. Were you, was... were you in that forum or no. were you aware of the forum? I, I was aware of it okay. now. I'm yeah. aware of it now. I wasn't aware of it then. Yeah. Did the revelations about Savile bring you back into contact with any of the Duncraft girls? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I can remember speaking to a lady called Carol that was there that contacted me. And she was very nice. She was just helping me sort of like, you know, it's not your fault and whatever. But we didn't carry on with the contact. So, but Kerry... I contacted because I saw what was happening about Freddie Starr. So, so how long were you involved with Operation U Tree? Right up until well, that was it until I got the money, I suppose. And what, were there any of it hearings or anything like that you had to participate in, or any inquiries you had to participate in? No. And were you offered psychological help at the end of U Tree? Nope. And how how was your mental state at the end of you, Tree? <laughs> Needing psychological help. <laughs> no, uh, this is when I went to my lady that I see, or I was seeing, and paid for it myself because I needed more and I couldn't get more. And, you know, did you go, did, were you able to see then that as a child, you know, you guys were like talking about Savile as, as a celebrity and you weren't seeing the harm he was causing you. Mm. At what point in your life were you able to acknowledge that that was the child and now as the adult I could see this that for what he was? When I got the letter, the thing that made me want to do this, I sat there and I thought, what if this was my girls? What if this had happened to my girls? What would I want them to do? And that's why I opened up the can of snakes. Because <laughs> I knew it was going to be, but I couldn't I couldn't handle how I was feeling anymore. I had to get it out of me. I've never talked about it in depth, never, apart from that one interview with the police. But... When the can of snakes was finally out, I imagine that that was you know you felt unburdened. But as the snakes was coming out, was that a vulnerable moment of your life? Yeah. <laughs> and how, how did you have a support structure around you to get through that? I've got my friends. I've got some good friends um, who I can speak to. I've got one that lives just across the green. I've got my, my as I said, my male friend Fred. Like. I've known him 16 years and I can talk to him about anything. So, but then we had lockdown and things, didn't we, as well? And I, oh, that put the mockers on stuff. Everything went out the window, <laughs> the therapy and everything. And it's, yeah. But. When one of the principals of Duncroft, and you probably know the woman's name, was asked about what you guys went through. She said, "Oh, they were just delinquents, and and kind of they had it coming." Have you have you seen uh, that statement? And do you know who that person is? Is that Miss Jones? I think so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, how did you feel 
when you read that or became aware of it? I wanted to go and see her <laughs> and shake her 92-year-old body. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but how can you... I wasn't... Because of what had happened to me in my life, it made me like I was. I wasn't... Uh, what's the word? I just can't think of the word. Right? It was life's, you know, what had been thrown at me. Um, I don't think I should have been there, but I was. Do you think that Doncroft has been held to account for what happened with nope. Savile, or do you think they've got off easy? No, nope. I do think they've got off very easy, because also the staff were saying that they were there in the evenings and they'd take us to the BBC and whatever. They didn't. They didn't. We 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 had the run of the place. We could go in the office and use the phone in the evenings, and as I said, we were doing tattoos and things and. Up to all sorts, you know. So yeah. do you think Don Croft went into self-protection mode and brought in spin doctors and just tried to minimise the damage for themselves by fabricating things and, and not portraying the environment as it truly was? Yeah, no, they didn't. What spin doctors? Sorry. People who weave stories into stories oh, right. that they are not <laughs> yeah. to, to try and save people's reputations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you know about her nephew as well, don't you? No. Um, who are you referring to? M M Marie and Jones. Yes. That's Miss Jones's nephew. <laughs> oh, my God. Did, we didn't know that, did we? Did you know that? Did you know that? We've done all this work on Savile. He disowned her. You just told because us Because of what was going on. No. That, we've recently tried to get him on. He's still, I've got him on my Twitter. <laughs> no idea it was the same <laughs> Joe. <a> nephew. <laughs> <gasps> so was he... Um... He was around when I was there. <sighs> and he had to go and... Yeah, because he was saying about it, you know. <laughs> Aren't you glad you met me? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. What would you like to see Don Croft do? Would you like to see them make a full apology off a compensation or? Um, it's a bit too late for that now, isn't it? Is it still open or is it? No, it's flats. I went, I actually yeah. went back up there. Did you? Just after I got the letter. So they've shut it and turned it into it's flats. turned it into flats. I've, I've actually got a photo of the staircase because I showed it to my daughter. I said, I used to scrub these stairs. <laughs> who, um, who would be legally liable though? Who owned it when it was owned? Mind. Who? Mind and the Met Police. Mind? What's mind? Mental health. And the London Metropolitan Police? Yeah. Oh, well, that, we've interviewed so many ex-London Met cops. That's, it's corrupt to the core over there, it's isn't it? It gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that the BBC has been held fully to account and done no. what they can? No. What would you like to see the BBC do then? Well, I, was, I don't know, but I was disgusted about the fact that the money I got was like a quarter of what my solicitor's got. How, how does that justify? I got 1,800. They got just over six grand. You're kidding me. Mm. That is absolutely obscene. <laughs> and who appointed that solicitor to you? Uh, I found them because everyone else was using them. Right. I actually complained about the first bloke. Yeah. He called me promiscuous. He said I was promiscuous. <gasps> yeah, hold on. There's a difference. Abused. Promiscuous. <laughs> um, the child is a victim of. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Is there anyone else you think should be held accountable? I mean, look at the interview that Savile did with Sorry Please and how he run rings around them. They come in. Is it all right if we can we call you Jimmy? We call you Mr. Savile. Um, thanks for inviting us to your office, Mr. Savile. You know all mm. this stuff. Mm. Do you think that there was a a malfunction there in the police? Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Especially the fact that they run the home as well. Um, yeah. Do you have any theories or thoughts as to how Savile got away with it for so long? Because he was clever. Because he was famous. Because of the charity work. Because of the places he went and the people he chose. The ones that 
probably wouldn't say anything. How do you think he managed to get so high up in society in terms of checkers with Margaret Thatcher, marriage guidance counsellor to Princess Di and um, Charles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the charity work, wasn't it? That was the main thing. Somebody who does charity work, they're wonderful, aren't they? No matter what they do behind closed doors. But, yeah. And how has your life been since Operation U Tree? Um, it's a bit up and down sometimes, <laughs> and but that's life. <laughs> um, my mental state, um, that's changed. That's changed. As I said to you earlier about the tight jaw, right. I don't really get that anymore. I don't know what I've done, but just talking and doing what I've done has has helped. Do you think other people who've been through these things who are watching this then and they hear you say things like that, you feel lighter, your jaw, the pressure's gone, do you think those people at some point when they're ready, they should talk to somebody that they trust? Would that help them? Oh, my God, yeah. I wish I'd done it sooner. But I didn't know... I had to do it sooner. I didn't know. I just, that was life, you know. But, yeah, definitely, definitely. And for those people who are in those situations, Sheila, who have either gone through them or may presently be in them who are watching this video, uh, wherever they are in the world, what advice would you give to those people? Talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. There's so much out there nowadays that... You can talk to somebody, you know. And would you advise them to go to the police or, or is there is there risks uh, when you do that? Because you did mention that, you know, <laughs> one of the jurisdictions was not um, very nice to you. Mm. No, maybe um, not to the police, first of all. Maybe do... Uh, cause, like things like child line and whatever, isn't there? Professionals who are designated for that kind of work, who are going to be more sympathetic. Hard. Yeah, but it's hard to do it, isn't it? Mm. Um, but, yeah, maybe something from this will trigger something in somebody and yeah, just talk to somebody. And how do you feel after telling your story today? Can I tell you that later? It's going to take a little bit for it to... <laughs> Sinking and resignate yeah, um, at three o'clock in the morning when I'm not asleep, <laughs> I'll let you know. Okay. No, I decided I was going to do this because I've never, as I said, I've never actually spoke about it. N no one has actually sat there and gone through all what exactly what happened. And I just knew by me that I needed more of it out. Yeah. I just, just knew. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good to hear. Yeah. And um, we feel that by doing these podcasts and letting people get that out, we hope that other people are inspired, you know, to talk to someone and try and get that pain reduced rather than falling back on the substances and the alcohol, which mm. we see over and over again in people's mm. life cycles, like what you've described today. And then you get deemed as the... The bad one, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. and that's why we're unruly, <laughs> and that's why we're campaigning on this channel mm. for the people who perpetrate these crimes to be properly held accountable at the right moment and to get long sentences because this it seems like several five hundred plus uh, victims, how many lives ruined, yeah. and then the knock on effects yeah, of the, the children. You know effect. when you when you you're falling back on the brown and going to prison, the children suffering and all these. And all that comes from the, the the very first actions of these monsters setting it in motion. Mm. And the government doesn't address that root cause. They give these monsters slaps on the wrist. You see these priests come in with these fancy lawyers and, and the, the church just moves them 20 miles away, 30 miles away, and they do it over and over again. It's absolutely sickening. Yeah. And, the, you know, and, and the, we see in the comments the public are really tired of it and they want the government to make some changes. And I think when they hear stories like yours what you've been through, that's the most powerful thing to make changes in society. Mm. 
and that's why we all thank you for, okay. for, for, for being so brave and your, your energy is lovely and as soon as i walked oh. into this house and saw these vibrant colors and the lavender smell and everything like that. <laughs> it's going to be a good day love it <laughs> oh thank yeah. you <laughs> do, do you have any questions james or joe you got any questions all right sheila uh, give us a hug then oh yeah. get me microphone out of the I'll way <laughs> thank you very much yeah that was brilliant was yeah thank you very much easier than I thought yeah. it was gonna yeah. be. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, being an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialized with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honor. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. I kill you! I yeah! A knife and a caution, all that like. Yeah! And he's looking at me and we went wide. Dave's gone now. <laughs> what is it about a tough guy that fascinates us? Imagine I'm hearing that, I'm thinking I'm not going down today. If I go down today, yeah, I'm dead. We're bringing you the very best of our interviews with Britain's hardest men. They made the mistake of bringing billy cubs, iron bars and knives to a gunfight. No rules fighter bash, Stephen the Devil French, and my best friend, Wild Man. Over two hours of terrifying tales of punch-ups, stabbings. That's what happens in that world. You, you leave people long enough, they get enough rope chain themselves. Attempted murders and exceptional all-round hardness. 